It's finally here. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth comes out this week. And so I wanted to revisit the original Final Fantasy VII game and use it as a way to explain about game hacking through memory manipulation, as well as looking at game hacking through save file hacking. The stuff I want to show you today is all about single player game hacking. I do not care for multiplayer online hacking because it ruins the fun for everyone but there are legitimate use cases for something like a save file hack i know that sounds weird but let me explain there was a glitch when i was playing this game a while back and if you got off your mount so your chocobo and automatically like you were right next to your submarine you would get into a glitch state where you actually couldn't move within the submarine and the only way to fix that was to manipulate your save game so your location was slightly out from where you were now this is a legitimate use case but also you know it's just interesting to know how games work and how processes work and how binaries work when they're executed and parts of the binary begin to be mapped into memory so let's take a look at it and let's take a look at how we could cheat it now i'll talk to you a bit about the save game I've got present here first. You'll see I'm in number one reactor, which is the start of the game in Final Fantasy VII. Now, my playtime is six minutes and I have a, this huge amount of gill, which is the currency in the game. So much that you would never ever be able to get this amount at the start of the game. The save file was fine, it was legit, but I manipulated it in memory as I was playing. So then when I saved my game, it was all kosher so above me there is cheat engine that is running that's going to allow us to look at what's happening in the memory of this process and to this direction of me there is a hexadecimal editor that's looking at the save file now the save file there are a few indications of what might be at the different locations and offsets in this hexadecimal that we're looking at here so for example there is this loud and then some numbers there is this e actor and then some values there's and if you know much about the game, you'll immediately begin to see patterns of, oh, that's cloud without the letter C, that's Barrett without the letter B, that's reactor without the letter R, and that's Sephiroth without the letter S. So these are all things that you can kind of see, but without understanding the actual format of this save game file, you're no doubt going to corrupt it if you try to modify it. So knowing the structure is inherently important. The other thing is that there's a manifest that goes along with these files, which I believe has a signature check. So I think that may be a checksum that when you save your game, it will calculate the checksum of your save game and make sure that that's present as well. So if you don't recalculate a new checksum and the checksum and the game don't match, then the game's just gonna say, no, you've got a corrupted save file. Hi everyone, it's Jai here from the future. So the metadata.xml file relates to the 2012 Steam release of the game. There is a signature check, which is an MD5 of the entire save file once it is appended with a user ID. And when there's no save file present, this is just an MD5 hash of the string QWERTY. This was found by looking at the commit history of Black Chocobo, which is a tool that I will discuss later on in the video. Let's jump into the game and look at how this works and dive in a little bit deeper. Okay, so let's start a new game and go from here. So there is this beautiful cutscene at the start of the game that we're going to fast forward through, but uh, you just kind of have to appreciate the time and effort that went into creating something like this back when the PlayStation 1 originally came out. The technology wasn't there, you know, it's not like we had massive amounts of RAM that could be used. Unlike nowadays, where it seems that compression for a lot of games seems to not even exist. And that seamless cutscene into actual gameplay happens. The, you'll notice a flicker as the, there we go, as it goes into actual gameplay. Just fantastic work. Uh, 
first thing I want to do, let's just say I want to grab a potion. I'll grab a couple of potions. Sure, why not? We might need them if we mess this up. Okay, so we get attacked by a couple of guards. Now, we have the health 302, but we get hit straight away before we can make a turn. So now it's on a wait mode now that I've set to take an action. Now, what that means is I can do anything and they won't attack me while I'm set to make this action. So I actually have 295 health. So let's do a search in Cheat Engine for 295. What this means is that we are going to be doing a scan to look for that value in memory. And we're going to do it. There's a good chance that this is just stored as four bytes. So we can choose what type of data we're looking for when we're scanning in memory. So we're going to look through literally all of the process memory. We can see that is down here. So let's look for the value 295. And there was only 21 addresses that came back. That's pretty remarkable. So we can add these to the address list. And now you might see that they are here. Now, in theory, if we take damage, so now, now we're at 291 health. So we can actually examine and look for what one's changed value. And you can see that this one is the only one that changed value. This went down to 291. So let's freeze this. So I've now frozen this address in memory, which means I'm sitting here, they can attack me. Oh, he missed me, so it was a bad example. So you'll notice as soon as I get hit and my health is reduced, health just restores back to the same amount that it was on. Now this is kind of giving me a level of pseudo invincibility. And I say pseudo because if they manage to do more than 291 damage in a single hit, then that's going to lead me into a situation where my health reaches zero, the next part of the code continues, and I'm dead in the water before the address can be set back to the value of 291. And we can actually change this. So we could modify this value instead of 291. Let's go 999 and go back to the game. And you'll see it's corrected to actually 302. So that's, it knows what my max value health is as well. And it makes sure that it doesn't surpass that. Now that's actually needed for stuff like cure spells, because if you're sitting at max health and you throw a cure spell out, it needs to be able to understand that you can't go past your max HP. So this is kind of cool, right? We now have a way of pseudo invincibility to heal ourselves tied to this particular character. But what else could we do? And what are some limitations involved with this? Well, first off, this is only an address through this particular playthrough. If I was to restart the game or restart the process, we're gonna be in a situation where this person's health is not at that address in memory anymore. And that means that we won't be able to, we, we'll have to find it all over again because it will be in a different place. We've got this situation, how do we make sure that we always know what to target? Well, there's something known as pointers. So you can actually find pointers to this particular address and use those pointers and their offsets to actually come to the right address every single time. But you have to lock into something such as a public variable that's always going to be at the exact same location and use the offsets to that variable to find it. So it's kind of a little bit more challenging. So there is something known as a pointer scan. So we could do a pointer scan for this address and run through it but I'm not gonna run through all the nitty gritty associated with that. Because something I created earlier was a cheat table that's for use in Cheat Engine, something known as a trainer. And that allows you to save particular variables or kind of the offsets to them to be able to refer back to them. So in this particular case, you'll see I have got Cloud's health again straight away. This is at a different address. I know where it is. How is that possible? And it's because I'm targeting this address. So as it's loaded into the game, the FF7 executable base address, and then I'm using an offset of 5AB108, which lands me at Cloud's health in battle. So max battle health Cloud is sitting at 302 here. If we modify this to say 999, go back to the game, uh, you'll see that now my health has surpassed that 302 limit. So this is only per battle. This is only tied while I'm in this battle and I can't just change this outside of the battle. So if I kill these enemies, I don't kill them with some, you know, fancy moves because we've been getting shot at for quite some time. 
Royally destroyed that person. And we've destroyed that person. Cool. So we've won the battle. We get some experience. And you'll notice that I also already had the cloud XP needed. And I get the six experience. Cool. Now I need 307 experience to level up. And I get the gill. Okay, so now you can actually see that my gill is sitting at 260. My XP needed is sitting at 307. There's 999 of my max health in battle. So if I change the XP needed, let's say I want that XP needed to be 1. So if we look at our status, uh, you'll notice that me gaining a level, it's sitting at I only need 1, like 1p, 1 experience point to get up that next level. If I make this 900, and I make this 900, straight away it changes in game because it's actually reading that from memory and so as it changes it changes and is reflected to us as well so if i was to change this 260 gil to something like 99,999 suddenly my money now goes to 99,999 so this is the way that you can actually just manipulate memory to get what you need all that your save game knows is it only knows what was in memory that it had to save at the time of saving your games. There was no protection of you tampering what was in memory prior to saving your game. Let's take a look at the save file a little bit more though. So there is this tool that has been developed called Black Chocobo. Now, this is open source and it was created by Chris Rizzatello, if I pronounce that right. And to give you a bit of an idea, if you look at the copying, this had its first commit somewhere back like 14 years ago. So this has been something that's been in progress for quite a bit of time and just continuously is still having new builds that come out about it, which is quite remarkable, really, considering the game is not exactly updating. There's just so much that can be done with it. Like, if you actually look, the same person who created that created something known as the FF7 Toolkit. And this is all about programming, so tools that want to interact with Final Fantasy VII can do so because of something like this toolkit. And this toolkit is going to define stuff that's needed. So for example, if we were to look at some of the header files for say a field item list, this is going to have all the nitty gritty. And there's so much work that has gone into this by you know true devs to know what particular offsets relate to and the structures of stuff. So we're talking Mac OS, we're talking PS3, PSP, emulator formats, everything which is remarkable, right? And I'll show you just how easy it is to use. So we have it open here and we can actually open up our save game. We have to select a save slot when we do that. So you may not see that here. Let me just make that a little bit more obvious. So we have to now select a save slot. So we do have this on our previous save game. So if we select that, now we actually have that actual file that is open and the program knows all the different structures that needs to be modified everything that needs to be done to make sure that it doesn't corrupt your particular game right so that's that's crazy like we could call this person crazy man crazy hair man oh that's sad i can't make it anymore and we can change the level so suddenly he's level 99 let's say that he's got sadness though because he doesn't have any friends Actually, let's give him friend. Let's have a chocobo on your party. Yes, a chocobo on your party, which is not part of the game. Sure, you can change your items as well. So just for funsies, let's give ourselves some cracker greens. Uh, seven of them. Cool. So now that's done. We've got heaps of gill already. Let's say the number of battles we've done. Uh, we're very experienced. We've done 9,999 battles and we've never never ran away. Um, at this point, you can actually see how it looks in a hex editor as well. So you could understand the different components that are being modified here. But if we just go back, right, we've we've got our party and we, we want to save this. So we save the save game and that's quite it. That's, that's it. It has now exported our save game. And if we go back into the game, 
Now, we will notice the changes have been reflected. So if we look at continuing, suddenly we now have Crazy Hair Man who's level 99 and is in the reactor. And we load the game and it's successfully modified everything. But let's see what happens if we get into a battle with these particular characters too, right? You, there's definitely that chocobo face. All right, we're getting into a battle. Um, but you'll notice that since they've got zero health and they're, they're dead, they're actually not present physically in this battle and they can't be targeted. But yeah, that's all. I just wanted to showcase Black Chocobo, how that can be used to manipulate the Final Fantasy VII save games, and also showcase Cheat Engine and how that can be used to manipulate the games in memory. So then you have kind of two methods of manipulating single player games, whether you are manipulating the save files that are on disk or you are manipulating the actual variables as they exist in memory before you write to disk by saving your game but that's it let me know your thoughts and feelings queries anything else in the comment section below and i'll see you next time